as we um, begin our Bible class. This is our week two of uh, consecration uh, before we gather uh, on the Lord's Day. So uh, if we can, just try to tell ourselves to relax, and we're going to move forward in Jesus' name. We've had um, fasting, uh, prayer this week, and we're going to continue. There will also be uh, Bible class tomorrow afternoon, as usual, uh, at 1 o'clock in the afternoon as the Lord leads us. Thank you, Jesus. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, and I'm going to uh, refer to uh, chapter 13, but I've wanted to uh, see something. The ministers know that when they come into my office and uh, we have prayer on Sunday before we come into the sanctuary, I have uh, several outlooks, and uh, these outlooks are to be used when we go to the hospitals and the nursing homes, and we can leave one of these periodicals uh, when we do, when we go to pray for members or friends of grace. And I've been overwhelmed by um, our presiding bishop, Bishop Theodore Brooks. Um, just to say a word or two in regards to him, well, number one, he's doing a great job. Great job inspiring the constituents of the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World and indeed, we are grateful unto the Lord for what he is doing for us. Um, I've known him for a while, but up close, he called me one day and uh, asked me to go to South Africa. No, South America. Get my consonants straight and round. And uh, he told me what was going on down there, that he had spent some vacations in the summer down in Rio de Janeiro. I had never gone there before, but I hurriedly, you know how you say, okay, all right, I'll, I'll go, not knowing what you're going into. Um, but it was overwhelming when I went. During that period, um, I was the Bishop of International Missions for the Pentecostal Centers of the World, so I did frequent uh, Africa and Europe, uh, the islands, um, various areas, the Far East, if you will of the world and did learn googles of things, if that's such a word. But when he asked me to go to South um, uh, America, down in Rio, just underneath, so it's, um, it's called also down under, where the water drains in the opposite direction <laughs> in your wash bowl. It drains in one direction north of the equator and below the equator it drains in the opposite direction. Well, you'll have to try to understand uh, what I'm talking about. But I arrived there and was downloading in my heart and mind. I saw schools, orphanages, hospitals. And um, in the name of 
a church. And I thought to myself, when I looked at the buildings, the buildings were old, weather-beaten. And I said to myself, boy, Christianity has been here a long time. Uh, through the Portuguese uh, and the Spanish-speaking pe people. Then I found out also uh, the Charismatics were there. Uh, even in the early 60s, if you will, when there were revivals on campuses across these United States, there was an explosion, if you, if you remember if you remember. And um, I explored and representing our missions department. And uh, we did some other things and I came back to Ohio. And um, he called me again. And he said, they want to get baptized in Jesus' name. I'm, I'm not talking about two or three or four or five. They had showed up on his porch one fall, maybe late fall, and they made mention to him, and I'm speaking of now Bishop Brooks, our presider, they said, we see what you were saying. He had been witnessing down in Rio de Janeiro. And they rejected his teaching and what he said initially. But they chose a group of men and they got on an airplane and flew to the United States and into Connecticut and knocked on his door. And they said, we see it now. And that is baptism in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. He wanted me to go because I represented our missions effort. So I went. And, and boy, did I receive an education. They had done some work and made prepara preparation. And um, we met at the riverbank. Never been in a situation uh, like this before, ever before. Amen. They gave me something to put on, um, and I put it on. It was a, a shirt that identified myself with those that will be doing the baptizing. So there were about 50 or so people that were doing the baptizing. And um, I was trying to get a, my bearings in regards to how many people. I stopped counting buses that looked like Greyhound buses. I stopped counting may I say Greyhound buses, at 77. They were parking parallel to each other, so I just stopped. I couldn't do all of that walking. And um, the wind was blowing and the dust was blowing, and all of a sudden they said, come on, we're going to start baptizing. They were playing guitars, and they were eating those pretzels, that do this, huge ones. It was like a carnival atmosphere. And all of a sudden we prayed, we began to pray. And there was a seriousness that came over all of the delegation, all of the people. And we started baptizing. You've heard me in sermons make mention from time to time a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And um, we started. And I started baptizing the, both sides of the riverbank. They had dammed up the water so the water would be high enough so we could dunk them. 
and they began to come to me and come to others. And I started. And how many ministers are here? Uh, okay. To do the baptismal formula. Okay. Anybody want to recite that formula, ministers? Or am I catching you off guard? Stick your head in. Stick your, he your head in. I want them to hear. Uh, this, is, this is Elder Thornton, one of those that does the baptizing. Yes, sir. Go right ahead. down in the water and you got a picture of that uh, who has gotten baptized at this church one two three okay maybe some others at other churches but move your membership in this direction I started off with the formula and I did it for about five six seven times ten times 20 times and then I I just said in Jesus name brought him up and another one in Jesus name and let me tell you we were doing this and demons were screaming using the voices of the people screeching and screaming and curdling if there's such a word, it was pandemonium. But we continued. Amen. The pastors were there. Deacons were there. But we continued baptizing. When the dust cleared, and in fact, I stopped. And when things began to cease, we had baptized over 2,000 people in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission or removal of sin that God might fill them full of the Holy Ghost. Amen, 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 amen. The Lord blessed us in a special way, and that work continued. Since then, uh, Bishop Brooks has been moved to the United States. He when we formed a diocese in Rio, uh, he was the new diocesan. I presented him to the bishop board, and the work that he was doing was very credible. And uh, he was one of the new bishops. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. No. Um, but they were many, some of them had the Holy Ghost prior to their baptism. Others got the Holy Ghost in the water. And some got the Holy Ghost after they came out of the water. So it was difficult because um, the number was a great number. Uh, kind of pandemonium. But it was good. It was a good spirit and attitude there on the riverbank, on both sides, if you will. Um, one thing, too, that was startling, that as we were baptizing, some of those who had not yet received the Holy Ghost, okay, but were getting baptized and the demons were being expelled, the demons cried out, using the voices of the people. You could hear the curdling sounds, the growling sounds as they were being delivered. There's something about that name. It's the name of Jesus. It will cause a stir. They don't want to hear it in the schoolhouses. They may 
try to drum up some legal term, etc., but they don't want to hear it. Amen. At the stadiums. One young lady, I've told you this before, came to me at their, just before their commencement in high school and wanted me to help her write a prayer. She was supposed to be responsible for praying at the beginning of the commencement. Amen. And I helped her write it. Okay? And I went to the commencement. And I didn't hear Jesus' name. I found out that um, uh, the faculty heard the prayer or read the prayer and X'd out the name of Jesus. Amen. But that's all right. His name is Jesus anyway. Salvation is in his name either way or any way. Uh, individuals ca can feel uncomfortable in regards to the name Jesus, and they don't want to hear it, be around it, but that's all right. Somebody wants to hear that name, and they want to be saved. Hallelujah. But this man um, paved the way. He was a pioneer, if you will, in that area. And now his diocese was moved uh, to Connecticut, and then God gave him another calling, and that was to be the presider of the Pentecostal Assemblies of the world. And that's where he is abiding right now. He's still on his second term as presider of the Pentecostal Assemblies of the world. And boy, did he do a remarkable job and is doing a remarkable, remarkable job. Now, perhaps I said all of that because of what he is doing spiritually. The Lord gave to him a theme. Anybody know what that theme is? Almost. That was, I believe that was last year, if I, if I remember correctly. Anybody else put their hand up? Pardon me? Okay. You're going to find it. You're going to find it in Acts chapter 2. There it is. Say it out loud. And they continued. Amen. Turn over in the book of Acts, in your Bible, second chapter. Second chapter. Yes. I'm going to pick the reading up in verse number 37. Um, this, of course, you're very familiar. This is the beginning of the New Testament church. All right. Verse number 37. This is after Peter preached the first sermon that the church has ever known. This is the beginning of the church and the first sermon that was preached after the church of Jesus Christ was born. We call it uh, the New Testament era. Amen. Now when they heard this, and that is Peter's sermon, and the results of Peter's sermon, people were being filled with the Holy Ghost. They were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? My, my. Then Peter said unto them, you've said it, you've memorized it. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Then he said, for the promise is unto you and to your children. What promise? The promise of being filled 
with the Spirit of God. Amen. And to your children and to all that are afar off, and that is those that are not saved. Those that are not saved. He didn't come to save a particular ethnic group. He came to save the world. That's what your Bible says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. So those that were afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call, and uh, with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves, save yourselves from this untoward generation. And in verse number 41, then they that gladly received his word were what? baptized and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 and I told you about 2,000 or more when I was part of that baptism where over 2,000 people were baptized this number that I had read over and over again didn't really seem like it was far fetched Whoa! Over 2,000 people. And here on the first day of the church of Jesus Christ and his birth, then they that gladly receive his word. Whose word? Jesus was already in glory. Peter's word. The one that preached the sermon and gave his altar call. They were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Everybody read the next verse together. My, my. And they continued. That's how we got in here. And they continued. It's mighty important that whoever comes to this light repents of their sins and are baptized in Jesus' name and receives the gift of the Holy Ghost, they too must continue. And again, that's how we got in here. Well, that's a simple word. You know, it doesn't seem like it's hard. But we're being challenged every day not to continue. Do you think that the New Testament church that is spoken of here and its beginning, do you think other churches with other doctrines have been started? Or no? They have. What's important, if you're a Bible reader, and I pray you are, We've read how the Bible says the church continued. We continued with the apostles' teaching, their dogma. Amen. Those particular articles that make up the faith. Amen. One of the scriptures will teach us and it's at verse number 42, and they continued steadfastly, how? In the apostles' doctrine. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. 
hold your point or my point. Um, I want you to turn back in your Bible to the book of Matthew. Would you please? Matthew, and you're probably saying it because I emphasize it. Chapter 13 and verse number 25. And it reads like this. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. We haven't said too much about the enemy. <laughs> Starting the church is a good thing. Having a set of teachings and doctrine and dogma and creed can be a good thing. But the scripture says in this parabolic approach in chapter 13, several parables. And this parable in verse number 25, it says, but while men slept. Slept is an easy word for what? Death. All of the apostles died. All but one of them was martyred. They were killed because of their teaching, because of the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Amen. So while men slept, don't think. See, as long as God has somebody preaching and teaching the word of the Lord, and the people begin to follow, it's difficult for the devil to get in there. Very, very difficult. But when there's an absence in the pulpit, when, you know, I heard uh, it was a statistic that 1,500 pastors a month leave the pulpit for various reasons but there's always somebody coming back there's always individuals that see the light and take up the banner uh, as the Lord calls them to preach the word preachers are needed but the scripture is talking about these preachers and namely these are the apostles whom Jesus gave the doctrine to. Somebody said, I'm going to preach it if it kills me. That's what it did. The Lord used them and he knew it would cost them their life. The only one that didn't die, according to history, as a martyr is who? John. Not John Baptist, but the apostle John. There was a hand. Could you, could you kind of lift your voice? You got to be at it. And I was trying to emphasize that a little earlier. What dulls our senses? Anybody? Pardon me? Boredom? Okay. Inactivity. Entertainment. Who said that? Oh, okay. Peek to your left. Okay, I see you now. Boredom. Pardon me? Well, there's a lot of things feeding us. It's got to be the right things to, to yes. It's, it's got to be 
You know the scripture, the principle behind the scripture, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You must ingest something greater than the status quo because those that are pushing the status quo are not thinking about heaven. Their mind is on the world and the things of the world. Sometimes we want to be like this one and that one and that one. Then he dressed nice. Oh, she looks so good. Find out where they're going, what they're ingesting, what philosophies they have before you want to ape after them. There's a whole lot of folk leading folks. My, my. But we have to form different habits than the habits that we had before we got saved. Wow. Different habits. Think about that for a moment. And we are creatures of habits. You know... There's been a challenge against the church, and it's been worldwide. And that challenge came by way of COVID. It forced us away from gathering. I don't want to be too long on that, but it did. For a period of time, we had a legitimate reason not to congregate. But it formed a habit. Then we developed other habits. And they were perhaps good habits. Family came over. We ate dinner earlier. And this continued, it's so innocent. But we have to shake ourselves and remember, these are the last days. These are the days when we are tried and tested. Yes, the Holy Ghost will keep you, but we've got a desire to be kept. Thank you, Jesus. And that's important. Churches lost members all over the city and in other cities. Amen. And around the world, wherever folk called themselves part of the church, amen, COVID touched perhaps every continent, every country in the world. And we're creatures of habit. You got to shake yourself. Hallelujah. Some of the Sundays when we started coming back, Sister Moya, about how many? 25, 20. Yes, it went down. But the Lord helped me. He taught me to preach to the angels. They were here. There were folk up in the control room sending what I preached out. I told you on one occasion, someone called me on a Thursday from Japan and told me um, they introduced themselves. They work for our government in Japan. And uh, they told me, she told me, she said, uh, I heard your Bible class yesterday and it was food for my soul. It helped me so much. She's in your pain. So the Lord showed us while we were in this depressed situation, there are other avenues. Amen. I heard from Italy. I heard from China. 
I heard from Africa. I heard from the Caribbean islands, people listening to the preaching and the teaching of the Word of God. On top of that, the angels were listening. I learned how to preach the word of the Lord and nobody was in the pews because the Lord said, send it out. And I would send it out. Hallelujah. Uh, but the membership had some options. <laughs> this is about the first time you could turn your device off. Click, turn the preacher off, and go make a cup of coffee. It's a different time, a different age. But we're trying to get it together by the help of the Lord. Now let me tell you, let me emphasize to you, and no little person come around from around the corner to tell me, there's going to be other points of opposition for we that are in this sanctuary we that belong to this church and other churches. These are the last days. But even though these are the last days, we must continue. Souls are dependent upon, and they don't even know. Men and women and children, and they don't even know it. I'm so glad, for instance, our children's church is coming. I'm so glad the Sunday school is picking up. I'm so glad to see new faces in the choir. But keep in mind, opposition will come against the church. I don't know what kind of opposition you'll have to stop and look at it and figure it out. The devil doesn't want the church of Jesus Christ to continue. Be it the one down on that corner, the one on the other corner, he doesn't want the church to exist. But we must continue as the scripture will teach us. Now, uh, in, the church, in the early days, now this is before um, the day of Pentecost, the timing. This is approximately, now, the day of Pentecost happened at 33 A.D., approximately 9 o'clock in the morning. Oh, pastor, how did you pinpoint that? It's in your Bible. It's been there all the time. And what I've read to you out of the 13th chapter of Matthew concerning the 13 parables, but while men slept, that was two years early before the church was born. Amen. These men at this time were not filled with the Holy Ghost because Jesus was still here. Hear me close. Well, what are you talking about, Pastor? Is this Bible class? Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 7. Jesus has to suffer and die and disappear before men are filled with the Holy Ghost. Chapter 7, amen. I'm going to pick up the reading in chapter 7 of John. And don't forget this scripture. Verse number 37, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirsts, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scriptures hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. He didn't say they were flowing then, okay? But it's going to happen. Verse 39, don't miss it. But this spake he of 
the Spirit, which they that believe on him, that's on Jesus, should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given. Why? Because that Jesus was not yet glorified. He's got to go to Calvary first before the Holy Ghost comes. He's got to die and be buried and rise on the first day. Hallelujah. And then ascend back to glory. All of that had to transpire. And at this point in the 13th chapter of St. John, it hadn't happened. Okay? I don't care what men say. It had not happened yet. Amen. So the Lord through his spirit is on the inside of us now. We have a helper. My goodness, we have a helper. Let me tell you something. The devil almost chewed me up and spewed me out but for the Holy Ghost. My, 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 my. He wants, what's the scripture say? The thief cometh not but for to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But I am come. I'm getting a little loud. Excuse me. <laughs> that you might have life and that more abundantly. The Holy Ghost is your keeper. It's your helper. My, my. So look for the enemy. Don't be surprised. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up, what? A standard against him. He will not leave us alone. I can promise you there will be trouble but he'll be greater than the trouble. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Uh, observation, question. You got it. Say that scripture again, chapter 15. 16. After the resurrection uh, chapter. Okay, verse 9. For a great door of effectual uh, and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. So what am I trying to arouse our thinking toward? Keep your head up. Keep your eyes open. Keep your ears open. Read your Bible. Come to church so you'll be in a position to discern the opposition of the devil. He's coming as a thief in the night. Yes, ma'am. Okay. 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 Battling spirits, yes. Yes. Demonic activity. Demonic, yeah. These, these, this happens so often, we're almost used to it. We're almost used to it. You can see things that are failing, things that are changing. So be alert, O people of God. Amen. And they continued. They continued how? 
steadfastness, in fellowship, in prayer. Absolutely. We must continue. Amen. I will, I'm a person like any other pastor that will be challenged. Amen. Sometimes by the membership, a lot of times by the membership in regards to the dogma. The, the, won't you do something different? Amen. Why don't you approach some other things to attract people? You have to be careful. The teaching of continuing is important. If it was right then, Scripture says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. The word does not change. The problems, the difficulties, the spirits, the devil. It's the onslaught of the enemy. It doesn't change up. And the only thing that we can use to combat the devil and his angels is what the word of the Lord tells us and teaches us. This is why we too must continue in the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. Hallelujah. We ought to feel something in regards uh, to this. We must continue in prayer. Amen. We must continue in fasting, continue in fellowship. I'm looking at the periodical of our organization and what our presider has been saying, if you've been receiving your Christian Outlook periodical, his articles have been surrounding that area, and that is continuing. I thought to myself, it, would I be here in the church if the earlier saints had not continued? Think of the people, amen, that when you were a child were in the church and they were Bible-toting folks. They, they learned the hymns and kept singing the hymns. They were our Sunday school teachers, our youth leaders, etc. And we were in all of those things as we were growing up. And the devil wants you to change your track. Get on another track. Start doing something else. But the devil is a liar. And the truth is not in him. Hallelujah. So it is important for us. And I'm going to pick up uh, in this area again. They're in Acts in chapter number 2. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. We're about ready to uh, do something. Um, this Friday um, will be our communion. And uh, the communion can take different faces depending on who you are, where you are, what's popular. What's going on? Amen. But it's important to continue. We get our cue from Scripture, not what's popular out there. Thank you, Jesus. And it's challenging because we're taught if there is anything that shouldn't be in our lives to get rid of it. Amen. Do a little house cleaning. This house. Ooh, I hit my microphone. Little house cleaning. Here. Thank you, Jesus. Instead of boldly 
walking up, we should be humbled when it comes time for communion, that kind of communion with God. Amen. I'm not that big and bad that I don't, I can just bop on into to the church and do what I have to do. You better humble yourself. Amen. If the Lord speaks to you, it ought to scare you. Yes. Amen. Scare you to the point that if you're not right, you'll get right. I would be afraid to partake in the communion service and I'm not right with God. But you can get right. Even church members can get right. Amen. How did they continue? They taught confession of sins. You don't have to get rebaptized. Somebody say amen. amen. You got baptized once and you're covered with the blood of Christ. But in our bold, fleshly way, sometimes we do what we want to do. Amen. Communion service is set up in the church to check us. Amen. It's a privilege to be saved. Not that the church needs me. Look, people have dropped out of the church. What does the church do? It rolls on. It keeps on going. I don't want it to keep going. If I drop out, wait a minute. Somebody, if, the, if there's a wire that you pull and stops the whole thing, but there's no such thing. I want to stay with the church. How about you? Hallelujah. If it means coughing up something, I'm going to cough it up in Jesus' name. Hallelujah to God. Well, pastor, if we have a confession, amen, what do we do? We come to you. What, do you confess? Yes. Who do you confess to? My peers, my fellow bishops, or the presider of our organization. Amen. And sometimes uh, our presider is loaded down. Hear me well. He's loaded down. Amen. So there are others uh, I can go to and pray with that the Lord will help me. Look, I mean to make it. How about you? The songwriter said, I'm going to make it. Help me to make it to that city called heaven somewhere. Hallelujah. Amen. One of the areas, again, where we must continue is in our communion service. Uh, and we're not going to finish, but I'm stirring up our pure mind. When we offer communion, it's full ordinance. Communion is an ordinance, okay? The Lord encouraged us through the apostles to have communion and to continue this teaching. And it's an ordinance. But let me use another word. Full ordinance communion. Full ordinance communion is the same teaching that the apostles had. Amen. And that is the partaking of the bread and the wine and foot washing. Did you get that? That's full ordinance. J did Jesus wash the apostles' feet? Yes, he did. Amen. You can find that in your Bible. It's been there. So the church of Jesus Christ ought to follow the teachings of the apostles. This is why on the shingle outside, by the sidewalk, you'll see apostolic or grace apostolic. Term apostolic is a derivative from apostle. Apostle. 
So this is an apostolic church. We believe in the teachings of the apostles. So we partake of wine. Well, pastor, what do you mean? What does wine have to do with it? <laughs> I told you before, uh, I hadn't been pastoring maybe five years. And that was not too long ago. And uh, I was at our district, not our district, but our council session when our pastors gather and preaching and teaching. And we broke for dinner. And when we broke for dinner, I sat beside a district elder by the name of Floyd Johnson, born in 1909. His daughter is a member of this church. And I was eating, sitting beside this seasoned gentleman and preacher and Bible teacher. And I was a youngster. And he turned to me and he said, Elder Gators, do you know why we use wine in communion? I've been pastoring five years. Amen. I said, uh, Jesus. Jesus used it. He saw me fumbling around. And then he schooled me. Now he went on to glory, but he schooled me. Why we use wine? Number one, grape juice is dead. It's severed from the vine. There's no life in it. It's dead. You take the grape juice down in the cellar. That's your burial. You leave it for a few days, and it changes its composition. It's not grape juice anymore. It's wine. You bring it upstairs, that's your resurrection. Jesus didn't do things haphazardly. Death, burial, resurrection. That's what we commemorate at communion. And the Lord knows how to drive it home. We're going to be in that service on Friday. And I'm hoping that with greater light and understanding, we can worship the Lord as the apostles did. And they continued. They continued. Come on, give the Lord a hand. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. Now we're going to stop. But there may be an observation or a question in regards